I'm Kat. And I'm Haley. And this is Night Classy. A tipsy night class teaching the oddities and curiosities you never learned in school. What are you teaching on this learning journey, Haley? I will be teaching us about a bizarre contest that took place in the 1920s in Canada. Sweet. What are you teaching us? So I watched the movie Fresh this weekend. Do you know what that is? Nope. It's a Hulu movie. It's about cannibalism. Mm. And that got me thinking about my, and I say this word loosely, favorite uh, real life historical example of cannibalism. So we're going to be talking about that. Okay. Interesting. I almost wonder if it's a topic that I almost covered. It probably is. It's so close. If you think like, oh, what's the most famous cannibalism story in the U.S.? Like, that's it. (laughs) Can I guess what it is now? Yeah, of course. Okay, is it the Donner Party? Yes. I was so close to covering them this week. No. I swear to Haley, God. how does that keep happening? I swear how to God. is that possible? Because we keep talking about it and keep getting so close. We're like manifesting doing the same we lesson. Are. I was like, I just don't have the time that I want to put into oh, this case. It has to be two parts. Yeah. Like I, I really, <laughs> really, really wanted to make it one part, but I was like, it, it's impossible. There's so mm. much. To do it justice. Yeah. I'm so, so glad you're covering it. And I'm yeah. so excited. What if, <laughs> and hear me out. No. <laughs> <laughs> what if I cover the first part this time and then you take over and do part two that next week? would be really interesting. Let's do something like that when I'm not about to go on a trip. Oh, fair, fair. Because if I wasn't going to be gone these next like couple of days, I'd be so like balls to the wall yeah. Donner Party research. It was like I chose it because I was like, I already know everything about this. Like this is going to be super easy because I didn't have like a whole lot of time. I knew it was going to be long, but I like I felt like I knew the story well enough that it would be easy to do mm-hmm. the research. That's Cheap that's thick. wrong. That's <laughs> it took me a really long time. Wow, I'm I'm like over the moon that you're covering it though. I think that you're a really good person to cover it and that you will do a phenomenal job in part one and two. <laughs> Thank you. If you like this story, have you read the book Hunger? No. I think it may have it was a night classy listener. It may have been Nate who recommended it, but it's like a fictionalized account of it's like it's a horror novel Mm -hmm. it's like a little bit supernatural based on the Donner Party and if you want like a like gross creepy horror book to read like in October or something definitely recommend thank you it was a quick read but it was fun it's called Hunger yeah okay I'm writing that down in my notes of things to remember (laughs) I read it like at the beach I was like this is my beach read (laughs) this really fucked up cannibal book yeah there are two types of people in this world the people who read rom-coms on the beach and the people who read Hunger on the beach. Yeah, we're not like other girls, okay? No. We're special. <laughs> Just if kidding. You, <laughs> if you hang out on the beach long enough, you'll surely have somebody who has uh, stayed out in the sun too long. They might start smelling like barbecue. It's It sets the scene perfectly. Yeah. It's a perfect I mean, per- beach read. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't be too happy. I think I was too happy at the beach and I was like, I need to just bring myself back to reality for a second. Let's balance this mm-hmm. out with one of the worst things that's, that's ever happened to anyone. <laughs> the Jersey man eater especially likes happy people. So you got to. Oh, that's true. I can't yeah, smell happy to sharks. That oh. would smell too good. Reel it in. Oh, Get it. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Thank so you. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're so welcome. I want to make an amendment, by the way. Speaking of Jersey man eater, it was brought to my attention that I said World War II was in 1916, and I promise I'm not that stupid. I know it was World War I. Thank it was you. A slip of the tongue. A little Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> a little uh, not paying attention to what's coming out of my mouth. Honestly, it's not fair. You would think after one World War, it wouldn't be like one and two. You would think it'd be mm. the World War. You know, right. like, did we really have to do it again? Obviously, we did. Um, yeah. But <laughs> don't take that the wrong way, please. <laughs> and I'm sure someone could answer this, but I wonder, like, when people started calling it World War Two, and if, like, the switch to calling the, is it the Great War? Is that what they called 
World War One back oh, before yeah. it was World War One. I. I wonder when that switch happened. They're like, oh, now there's a second one. We yep. got to rename this. And now I feel like any instance that is kind of like big in the news with a bunch of countries, we we've been calling out World War Three. Yeah. like it's coming. World War Three <laughs> is about to happen, but it's Did, always about to happen. It's always about to happen. So was World War Two always about to happen in the eyes of the public? Were they like, this is it? This uh-huh. is we had the Great War, and now this is the terrific war oh no it was <laughs> so kind of like, like wham bam with those two it yeah, was like 30 whiplash. years later i know yeah. snip snap snip snap <laughs> we've had a bit a of a break. break i think it's coming how many world wars do you think there's gonna be before humanity is gone um if there is one more i think it'll be one i think that we are really snuffing ourselves out at a, you r- think, <laughs> at a rapid pace you think there will only be one more yeah, I okay. think so. I mean, I don't really see humanity lasting hundreds of years. You don't? No. I feel like we've got planet. another I think we've got another thousand in us. You know the Perhaps. the famous Einstein quote of I don't know what World War 3 will be fought with, but I know World War 4 will be fought with sticks. Mm. No, but yeah. that makes sense. That does make sense. Mm-hmm. And there's this theory that I've thought about covering um, for a night classy that we're not the first like civilization, mm. but humans aren't the first civilization because as let me try and break this down like on Earth, short way. on Earth. Yes, because we create a lot of carbon and we'll be able to see that in in the soil and millions and billions of years you know back in the soil there's this time period where there's a ton of carbon and if you think about fast forwarding if humanity stopped now and millions and millions and millions of years nothing really would be left it would really just be a layer in the soil but we have fossils from like a like millions and millions of years ago yes true okay Interesting theory. Interesting <laughs> what do you theory. mean? What do you? Well, wouldn't there be like some kind of record? Like if there was a civilization that like could, mm-hmm. you know, the layer of soil. And this is just like a precursor research I've done, but it is okay. a theory. It's like okay. the Silurian theory. It's from further back than when we have fossils from this mm. layer in, in the earth. We soil. just, it was like an etch a sketch. They shook it clean yeah. and started over. Yeah, we were like, the earth was God's litter box. <laughs> <laughs> it pretty much still is. Yeah. <sighs> Dude, well, I was just thinking the other night, sorry to interrupt, no. but just how crazy it is the dinosaurs actually exist and how you're trying to interpret that when you're a little kid and like there's all the toys with monsters and stuff and you're also getting toys that are dinosaurs. And your brain trying to piece together, like, wait a second, wait a second. (laughs) Those were real? real, Sometimes not. (laughs) I feel like it's hard. Like, I, it's weird that we never questioned it more. You know, like, Mm -hmm. I was a kid, someone handed me a dinosaur toy and said, these used to be real. And I just said, okay. You want to believe, I think. At least I did as a kid. I was like, okay, cool. (laughs) Of course we want to believe because they're real. But it's like, okay, this thing the size of... Like, I don't even know, a giant semi truck, a Mm. lizard that big used to walk around. Yeah. And we just like, oh, yeah, of course it did. I think it's one thing to know that they're real, but then it's another to have that as your truth, like to actually Mm. be able to witness, you know, a T-Rex, which T-Rex and humans weren't even on the earth at the same time. No. Why do you say that with a question in your voice? (laughs) Of course they weren't. I just. I Listen, I make plenty of assumptions and I wasn't, I was 99% sure. Okay. 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 (laughs) You know how, have you seen those TikTok videos where they talk about our time periods being messed up? Like how people didn't know that, you know, uh, Anne Frank and Martin Luther King Jr. were born like in the same year. Um, I don't know. I just was worried that my timelines were messed up. (laughs) (laughs) That's. I'd rather Fair. I'd rather be stupid and question it than stupid and confident. That's true. It's it's like how uh, when you're not feeling your best, you want to wear sweatpants. Like you don't want to be feeling like you look shitty in a dress because then it looks yeah. like you're trying <laughs> and you looked ugly. Whereas yes. like I want to look ugly on purpose. Yes, there should yeah. be a reason. <laughs> Can I restate so though the interesting timeline that I saw online? Uh-huh. I think I've said this on the show before, but I'll say it again. 
that a Tyrannosaurus Rex is closer to the invention of the iPhone than it is to a Stegosaurus. Wow. Yes, that, thank that is you for wild. that. I think that was like two episodes ago. Feels fresh. What if yeah. I? What if I like <laughs> accidentally said it every episode? Just had amnesia. <laughs> and I'm, I know I'm picking on Haley, but if you had asked me were Stegosaurus around when T Rex was, I would say, oh, of course, obviously, <laughs> obviously they are. <laughs> all dinosaurs were together all of the times. I mean, why wouldn't they be? It just makes sense. I'm looking at some dinosaur stuffed animals right now. Alec has some in his office. I kind of so many dinosaurs. Can I in hold here? one? Sure. Thank you. The I mascot. Want I want that one. This I got him this one. So I'm going to hold cute. this one. Yeah, I Isn't like it. it? Cute? I like yeah. it too. I'm I don't know like if we've ever you. said this to the listeners, but the reason it's Parasar Studios is because the Parasar has this big crest on its head and they can blow air through it and they could communicate like six miles apart from one another. So it's kind of like podcasting through the airwaves. It's there. That's now on the record. And now everyone buys Alec dinosaur toys. Yes. And the this office is full of them. Be- Packed, yeah. The perfect hoarding situation, I'm sure Alec would love. <laughs> <laughs> and shout out to our fan Nate. I am sending I am I am sending him a hat with Parasaur on it. Oh, Ooh. that's nice. Why? He complimented it on Be Real or mm. Instagram or somewhere. Nate also told me today how to become a wizard. So I'm very excited about that. Didn't I you told him it's gonna be Witch Girl Summer? Go to wizard school? I dropped out of wizard school. Oh, okay. If you recall, I signed <laughs> I up now. and I paid tuition. Immediately <laughs> dropped out. I went to one class. Wizard school dropout. But Haley and I are in witch school right now. We've talked about this, but we are becoming yes. tarot card readers. Oh, I'm so excited and skilled. If you asked me anything about what we've learned, I could not tell you. Much. Oh, I couldn't tell you a single thing. I know that the fives are bad, right? It's the fives. I don't know. I think we talked about this last week. Maybe we I know the journey remember. of the of the fool. Yeah, except I couldn't tell all the you different a single phases. Part of it. Yeah, I know that the fool is kind of like naive. <laughs> yes, um, that's it's a good about lighthearted it. card. It's fun just to sit in someone's attic and drink wine while they shout at you about tarot cards. Yeah, I'm really more there for the experience. <laughs> yeah, I'm there for the vibes. <laughs> I'm really dreading the day when she's like, "Okay, now it's time to practice." I, 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 I just like sitting there and listening. <laughs> yeah, when I say I'm an experienced witch, it's not what you think. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, speaking of, for some reason, this made me think of it. You texted me yesterday asking if I had listened to the podcast Wine and Crimes yes. episode Gossip at the Corpse Cart, and I had started it, but I hadn't actually gotten into the bulk of the episode. And we're famous. <laughs> uh, Haley got shouted out. <laughs> A, um, not even article that I sent in. I forgot that I sent it in, but Amanda read it for her like headlines section. <laughs> and I think you all might remember the story that I shared. And I shared this on the Facebook um, for Night Classy, maybe not even on the show, but you all can go over and join our Night Classy Facebook group. It's Night Classmates. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I sent it in because I just had to share with everyone. It's my favorite story ever about a cat who eats its owner's toe after she accidentally chops it off. So that was very exciting. And I forgot that I sent it in. So yeah. when she said Haley M, I was like, oh, haha, cat text me because we have the same name. <laughs> that would be crazy if it wasn't you. Yeah. Because I, I heard Haley M and I was like, I wonder if Haley sent something. And then it was the cat toe story. I was like, okay, of course this is Haley. Yeah. That'd be wild if there was a different Haley M that was also obsessed with that story. Yeah. Maybe it's just in our blood. Maybe. In an alternate universe. You know what? If there was an entire human race before we were here, anything is possible. <laughs> that would surely be what I was doing in this alternate universe slash past civilization. <laughs> Still talking about cats and them. Uh, being cannibals. <laughs> Before we get started, what are you drinking today, Haley? Um, we have a box of Red Revolution Boda Box wine that we're sipping on. Yes, I too am sipping on it. It uh, does not pair well with the mouthwash that I just used. Yep, that's what I said. You got to just chug some wine and soon enough the mouthwash will be out of your mouth. All right, I'm going to chug this wine while you tell me a story. All righty. So our learning journey begins Halloween night. 1926 in Toronto. Charles Vance Miller was staying in the office downtown, burning the midnight oil when he experienced a heart attack, which killed him. Previous to this, Miller had lived a good life. The office he died in was his own law firm, Miller, Ferguson, and Hunter, and he made money as a lawyer. He's a lawyer. lawyer. 
<laughs> but he also dibble dabbled in other things too. He served as president of the O'Keefe Brewing Company and also owned a successful stable. In fact, in like with horses, with horses. Oh my god! Um, in 1915, two of his horses, Tartarian and Fair Montague, finished first and second at the King's Plate. Tartarian, like the Tartarian Empire. Yeah, <laughs> it's spelled different. It's spelled with an e instead of an i. I didn't get a chance to look it up, but I wondered. I was like, mm. is he a believer? <laughs> Miller was kind of shy though, so when his horses won, he didn't immediately go up and claim the prize. Um, he simply went home and later donated all of the money to the hospital for sick children. Wow. That's yes. not what that hospital was called? Yes. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a bit on the nose, don't you think? <laughs> I work at the school for learning children. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, I work at the department for special children. <laughs> exceptional children. Exceptional children. That is actually what the department's called. Department of Exceptional Children. Anyway, <laughs> literally what it's called. Literally. Much like <laughs> the hospital for sick children. Yes. And I literally work at the school for learning children. It's, just kidding. No, I don't. It gets, it's explicit. It gets the people going. Right. You ought to <laughs> just name things what they are. Yeah, and it's funny because we're preschool special education, and the Department of Early Childhood is over preschool, but we're like our own special thing. So what I'm saying is is the initials for DEC is same for Department of Early Childhood and mm. Department of Exceptional Children. Mm. So it gets very, very confusing. That is confusing. I know. They need to come up with a way cooler name. Yeah, or just like for DEC for... Department of Early Childhood, throw an H in there, like separate child and hood. And then it could be <laughs> DECH out Detch. of the hood. <laughs> well, you know, you know what I mean. Like just <laughs> like throw an extra letter in to differentiate. Yeah, definitely. Or it could be like the cult of exceptional children. That might be mm, more fun. That definitely the, sounds more uh, interesting. It does sound it does sound more interesting. What's another good word? You know how some animals have special names for their groups? No. Like a... Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> like a murder of crows. Yes! <laughs> we've got Cole, we've got murder. Okay, no, we're taking murder off the table, but Yeah, you see we don't what want I mean. murder in the same sentence as children, please. Absolutely not. <laughs> so anyway, he donates all of his money to this hospital for sick children, and upon his death, news... That's odd regarding his will was being reported. He didn't have any children of his own or immediate family members. And when he was writing his will, he designed this legal document to, quote, test the morals and beliefs of his contemporaries. Hmm. So to start off, he left all of his stock in the historically Catholic owned O'Keefe Bear Beer Company to all of the Orange Lodges and Protestant ministers engaged in residing in Toronto. Like just to stir the pot? Seemingly to <laughs> stir the pot, yeah. So if you're unfamiliar, Orange Lodges of Ireland are formed of Protestants who are committed to the protection of the principles of Protestant Reformation. And if you all don't know about the troubles in Ireland, then go look it up. The Catholics and Protestants did not get along. And every ordained minister in the surrounding area, except for one guy who shot a hotel keeper one time, except for him, every other minister received a single share of the Kenilworth Jockey Club stock. And the Ontario Jockey Club shares were split between three people. Two of them were strictly against racetrack betting. Hmm. So they were like, well, this is a conflict of interest. Oh, I see what he's doing. Yes. He's making see if they take the money. Question. Yeah, their morals and beliefs. Hmm. These three men could only claim their $1,500 each if they did it together as a group. And if any of them opted out of the money, no one got anything. Wow. So this is, uh, this is like a little reality show that he's putting on for his ghost. Yeah. He he was worried about his entertainment in the afterlife. Well, I think he definitely succeeded in creating it. Oh, yes, he did. There is a drama. Miller also gifted his holiday home in Jamaica to three other lawyers who did not get along with each other. They all had, like, timeshares, basically. But the written rule was that if any of them sold their share, the cash couldn't go in their pocket. It had to be donated and distributed amongst people living in poverty. 
The second to last stipulation was that a donation to the Hospital for Sick Children and Miller's alma mater, the University of Toronto. Um, The rest of his money would be donated there. And the final clause, number nine, was the one that makes this a night classy lesson. The remainder of Miller's estate was to be liquidated into cash, which was then invested over the course of nine years. Over the next 10 years and on the anniversary of his death, all of the investment money and the money made upon that investment was to be given to the mother who had since his death in Toronto given birth to the greatest number of children as shown by the registrations under the Vital Statistics Act. But why, though? So it's unclear i (laughs) he just has a birth fetish his ghost wanted that entertainment as well as watching people fight the like communist in me is pointing to uh, capitalism being like he was you know he needed a working class he needed people to to (laughs) give birth to have babies to work in the factories (laughs) oh my god and his friends i'll get to this in a second but his friends were like oh my god he actually did it like they all thought it was a joke yeah he it talked, sounds like a joke <laughs> he talked about it all the time <laughs> this is something tommy would do i'm not even kidding no yes no well, he always makes weird jokes like this and you always <laughs> think it's a joke and then like what if one day like he actually does it i don't think he would do something like this no but it's a similar concept like oh i'm gonna do this ridiculous thing yes nobody takes it seriously and then uh, and then it's this time you actually do it (laughs) ties were also fair in this so in the case that winners tie they would split the fortune he did give us some insight to his motives when he wrote quote the will is un is is necessarily uncommon in capricious 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 i'm sorry capricious because i have no depend no dependence or near relations and no duty rest upon me to leave any property at my death and what i do leave is proof of my folly in gathering and retaining more than i required in my lifetime but okay. Okay, I'll I'll get to what I was about to say. But news spread quickly of this essentially baby-making contest with this undisclosed amount of money for this cash prize. It would suck to be the runner-up. It's like, yeah. I had 12 babies and in nine for years <laughs> for this money. This was yeah. supposed to be and my meal what? ticket. And yeah. for... For nothing. So it was kind of a risk to mm-hmm. get into it. But if you felt, you know, strong enough in your fertility, then some people went for it. Uh, like on purpose, like for this reason. It was split. Some of the people we'll see already had a bunch of kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially there's controversy because a lot of the families in who entered in the contest were experiencing extreme poverty and didn't have access to contraception. Right. So it's kind of fucked. It's like, for me, I'm sitting here thinking, doing this research, like, okay, if you cared so much about giving back and being able to provide contraception and help out people experiencing poverty, just be a philanthropist. Just yeah, I mean, he, that's donate clearly your money. not what this was about. Yes. This was about his, his funny joke. Yeah. And it's yeah. odd, too, because he's described as being very shy and reserved and he just had a really weird sense of humor very weird very very weird and like him not wanting to go down and claim like his racetrack winnings make me think like he like always wanted to be a jokester but like was too nervous to have this spotlight and so like now he got to do it once he wasn't like there for all the attention <laughs> yeah. to be on him you know <laughs> but it was still yeah a joke it was this mm-hmm. is his legacy yeah now <laughs> the globe called it a freak document and miller's friends speculated about why he did it saying you know he said it was a joke he told all his friends about it and this quote comes from charles kemp The relationship between Miller and Kemp seems slightly obscure to me. Kemp was at least 50 years younger than Miller and was cited as his business partner. But when Miller died, the two had been living together in Miller's bachelor pad. 
And Kemp had received $1,000 from the will, which is about $17,000 today. Um, Author Mark M. Orkin posited that the two had a kind of like surrogate son relationship. Mm. But I'm like, maybe it's more like a daddy (laughs) relationship. But I mean, it could be either. We don't want to speculate. Absolutely not. Certainly a possibility. I did a little bit, though. So (laughs) I do apologize. But it just seemed vague. So before I get into the baby making business, I'll just quickly tie up the loose ends of the other recipients of the will. The guys who were staunchly against horse hate. Ra- horse racing. Horse hating. Royce hating. <laughs> <laughs> they were roid raging. They found a loophole in the will. They joined the jockey club for literally five minutes and then sold their shares to other members and were on their way. So they were out. Did they get money, though? They did get their money. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The ministers from the surrounding area who were gifted their share in the Kenilworth stock went to cash it in, only to find that their shares were worth half a cent. <laughs> <laughs> and the holiday home in Jamaica that had been gifted to the three lawyers who hated each other had actually been sold years before Miller even died. Wait. And he didn't know that? Um... I don't know if he knew it or not. He certainly didn't. So he willed update. a house that he didn't own. I think at the time he did own it when he wrote the will. Oh, but I between see. And then him just forgot it, to take it out of the will. Yeah, forgot or thought that it'd be funny. I can't imagine mm. it was easy to be gifted something in a will and go through that whole process for them to be like. Uh, <laughs> looks like he sold it ten years ago or however yeah. long. <laughs> So all of that bringing us to Klaus, Clause 9. Before he died, Miller committed himself to ensuring that this portion of the will was ironclad, no loopholes. And as you can imagine, there's public outcry against encouraging families to procreate as much as possible on the slim chance that they win this possibly life-changing money. Margaret Sanger said Miller's will was reducing women um, to being animals and was deplorable. But supporters of Clause 9, including the judge, Middleton, argued that Miller was just trying to bring attention to the plight of women raising many children. Oh, yeah, that's what... mm, Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question, too? So he donated to the Protestant houses of worship? Yeah. And And he's pro... And he was the president of a Catholic organization. Okay, I'm trying to get him straight. So he's not Protestant. No. Okay, he's very Catholic. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, at I least had it I mixed think up. he was the president of this Catholic organization. I don't know if he was Catholic, but, but it I would was like a he was. it was a brewery, right? Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah it's just I don't think he. I mean, maybe he was Catholic, but I perhaps. Mean, but yeah. it, the brewery was notoriously okay Catholic gotcha. organization, a drinking organization. <laughs> <laughs> I had misunderstood. I thought he was Protestant, and then also being like, don't use contraception. I was like, wow, what a weird guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he's complex for sure. Definitely um, not understood. <laughs> uh, so yeah, he was trying to apparently bring light to people who are more than likely living in poverty and not having access to birth control. Colonel John Bruce wrote, quote, Miller's hope was that by turning the spotlight on unbridled breeding and making <laughs> Toronto a laughing stock before the world, he could shame the government into legalizing birth control. Oh. Yeah. Maybe. So yet again it's a twist. Yeah. Well, I just I don't think he was doing like... anything except making a joke. Yes. That only he thought was funny. He like went the total wrong way about it, I think. If these were truly his motives and obviously things were different in the nineteen twenties, yeah. but there was a better way. If these were motives, like <laughs> if he had a motive, we would know what it is. <laughs> it would be very clear. Yeah. And maybe in this legal binding document called his will. Yeah. I, this all, it all, it's, it, this is all just for his own Something's entertainment. Something's not adding up. I'm picturing him as Jigsaw from the Saw movies and <laughs> that he has a little puppet clown that's like, do you want to play a game? <laughs> <laughs> Ew. And uh, this also goes back to me that millionaires billionaires are fucking weird they're weird they're as weird. hell they're did you see touch. that stuff that came out about elon musk today about how he has a twitter burner account where he role plays as a child 
oh, you know. Like Goo Goo Gaga? I, like, I like he'll comment on stuff and be like, I wish I was old enough to go to a nightclub and like <laughs> shit like that. <laughs> he needs therapy. Yeah. He needs, therapy he needs a lot of things bad. that money can't buy him. <laughs> <laughs> That's disgusting. Yeah, it's That's real creepy. That's what predators do. Oh. That's what predators for do. For sure. I yeah, mean, he is a wacko. Jeez. Um, unrelated, but news <laughs> that I heard today. Did you hear about Miley Cyrus releasing an album under like a ghost name? No. So, okay. She released these songs under a ghost name. Let me figure out what it was. Justin was te- texting me about it today. Um, it is un- It was under the name Sierra Clara Pierce. But as of today, it's getting pulled from everywhere. Like it came out in March and it was on Spotify. And nobody figured it out until now. Until now. And it was like clearly her. I listened to one song and then it got pulled from Spotify. Why would they pull it? Because, okay, I have a theory that it's actually an AI creator. It was an entire album. It sounds exactly like her. But it also got pulled from YouTube. Like Justin sent me the YouTube playlist this afternoon and then texted me when I was on my way here. He was like, fuck, it just got pulled from YouTube too. Dang. So I'm wondering if it's something like that. Because, like, yeah. you know, she has published under Hannah Montana, Miley Cyrus, mm. something else. I think this would be her fourth. Um, yeah. So that was weird. Stay tuned. That is wow. weird. Needs and it probably was an AI. A whole topic. It should be, yeah. Hmm. But it'd be insane for it to be a whole album because, it, well, maybe not. It just takes a long time if they plugged enough information of other Miley songs into an AI. They could probably yeah, make Yeah, I mean, a whole don't album. you just make the AI listen to all the Miley songs and it just spits music out? Is that not how it works? I think it's a more complex than oh. that. Because it took so much work just to create that one Drake AI song. Did it take a lot of work? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. (laughs) Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe it's possible. Maybe it's like once it's listened to enough of the Mm -hmm. music, then it can create a whole album. But that's my theory about this Miley thing. Mm, I like it. Mark my word. Or maybe this is promotion for the album she's now going to release under her name. Mm, like yeah. maybe they were waiting until it got like people figured it out and it got publicity and they pulled it and now she's going to release it under her own Spotify. Yeah, that's a good theory. We'll we'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> and it's weird, too, because on Spotify, I don't even know if it'll pull it up anymore. But OK, here it is. Here's the picture, the album cover. Oh, that she had. It's for like it. a, a Facebook profile picture of a random girl. Yeah. Yeah. Bizarre. Yeah. Anyway, (laughs) back to the learning journey. It was unclear initially if this will in Clause 9 was legitimate or not. Nonetheless, women came forward to throw their uteruses into the ring. The Daily Star took special interest in this contest and assigned a special reporter just for this case. They actively pursued and signed pregnant women into exclusivity agreements. <laughs> I thought you agreements. were going to say they signed pregnant women. Like they were signing their <laughs> Stamp bellies. Them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Seven years into the contest, in 1933, Grace Bagnato was in the lead. She worked as a court interpreter and had given birth to seven Seven children since Miller died and had another bun in the oven. Only one a year, though. One a year. Somebody got to pop out twins. Uh, That's what I'm saying. That's where you win the jackpot is if you can do like a double or triple. And the Dion quintuplets were born in this time period, but they were just a bit too far from Toronto to be considered. Missed opportunity. That sucks. I know. Their mom should have gotten on the first bus to Toronto as soon as she figured it out. As soon as you figure out Mm. you're in labor. Right away. Um, Let's see. What else here? There was another woman technically tied with Grace. Florence Brown had also given birth to seven children in the contest time window, but only six had survived. Oh. And this brought up the question yeah. of, does well, it count? does it count? No, okay. it doesn't. They're like live babies only. Ooh. Yeah, I know. Rude. Miller's distant family members and even the executor of his own will tried to get the money themselves. 
the judges throughout both of these cases, and basically what happened was Miller had this distant cousin and a half aunt living in California who were trying to qualify as next of kin, but they were like, nah. And then his half aunt in California died, and the executor of her will tried to get the money from Miller's will. (laughs) Okay. If it didn't work for the aunt. (laughs) He's like, I can lawyer my way out of this. No, (laughs) sir. So there were distant cousins coming out of the woodwork altogether. The Canadian government also wanted a piece of the pie. Attorney General. They got a piece of the pie. They get the taxes. (laughs) They got so much. He, the Attorney General. William H. Price introduced a bill that would try, that attempted to claim the Miller baby fortune for the province. He proposed they use the money made on investment to pay for scholarships at the University of Toronto for the fi- first five years, and then the rest would be given to the university directly. Uh, didn't he already make a big donation to the university? Yeah, he made a huge donation. It was like all of his money went, the rest of it went to the university, and then This investment was what was liquidated from his property. Imagine donating to your university. Like, I donated to you for four years. I don't need to give you any more. And continuously donating. Uh (laughs) Still doing it. $150 a month. (laughs) Just kidding. I'm not at that point yet. But (laughs) plenty of people are. We stay donating. Anyway, this really pissed off the public. At this point, The Depression has hit, and they're in the thick of that bitch. What was called the Great Stork Derby, that's what they started calling this thing, (laughs) had become the the pie-in-the-sky dream of every subsidence family in Canada. The Attorney General received over 14,000 letters documenting people's absolute outrage that the government would dare to claim the Miller money themselves. For real. It's not I'd be theirs. Pissed too. Yeah. yeah. Like, like it's a stupid fucking contest, but the government can't just take it. And if you are going to take it, at least redistribute it in a way that honors what he was supposedly trying to yeah. achieve. Yeah. Like family planning services, uh, welfare. Yes, exactly. One of the women in the running, Florence Brown, said the Ontario government is taking money from children that need it. That family had 27 children. What? They needed it. Yeah. 27 children. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Can you All imagine? All from one mom? All from one mom. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And I do have pictures. Um, this one, they're actually in the second slide, but... There are just a couple of clips here. This is, yeah, that's the Brown family before they had all, uh, t- or no, that's not the Brown family. I'm sorry. That's the Carter family. The Brown family, nope, I didn't include a, <laughs> a picture of them. Psych! <laughs> um, but the first two slides are just pictures of the two of the families. As you can see, everyone looks super duper happy yeah, to they, be there. Yeah, <laughs> they know it's the Great Depression. Especially the moms. God. Oh. The mom. Is that the mom in the middle? Yeah. Yeah. She looks like the most miserable. (laughs) Yeah. I don't think they had Lexapro back then. (laughs) And to imagine being, and I haven't experienced this myself, but um, possibly being in a constant state of postpartum depression. Oh, true. Just, and just regular depression because yeah. you uh, have so much stress in your experience. Yeah, the the experiencing poverty, mm-hmm. the Great Depression, the you know most of these women were not working. It was just the husbands. No, ca- I mean, they were working. They were caring for yeah. twenty fucking children. True. Yeah, that's so true. Um. Yeah. So there was just a lot, a lot going on. Women were allowed to enter in this contest whenever. So some women entered early, some entered late in the game. As long as they had documentation that their children were born within the time window and in the Ontario area, they were valid contestants. A year before the contest closed out, Lillian Kinney was in the lead with 11 children. Second place was tied with nine eligible children. Money was a big factor for many of them, but the main motivation um, wasn't necessarily that for all of them. Um, Grace Bagnano pointed out that she already had 13 children before the Derby and, quote, had all her children but one before she had any intention of putting her name forward as a contender. 
But as we've already stated, many of these families were experiencing extreme poverty. Any last minute contestants who wanted to enter the contest were encouraged to throw their hats into the ring leading up to October 31st, 1936. With last minute entries and various documents to review, it wasn't clear who had won right off the bat. There were more questions of whether unregistered births counted, if children born out of wedlock were valid, Mm. if a mother with more than one father to her various children was quote unquote valid. By the time the smoke cleared, there were six women tied for first place. Lucy Timlick, Kathleen Nagel, Annie Smith, Isabel McLean, Lillian Kenny, and Pauline May Clark all had nine registered children. That seems low because it was nine years, right? Yeah. So nobody had twins and a baby every No year. one had twins. Three of them had actually given birth 10 times, but mm. only nine were valid. So wow. from what I can what I can discern from the research is that um, not all of their children survived. Yeah. With money hanging in the air, the courts got involved again and upheld the ruling from a decade earlier. The will was legit. The contest was legit. In 1938, four women received their share of the Miller baby money, about $125,000 each, which is $2.6 million today. Not worth it. (laughs) I will say the runner-ups also received money. Um, other runner-up mothers received smaller amounts as their stillborn, illeg- quote-unquote, illegitimate, um, don't love that, um, or unregistered children did not count officially, but they still did receive some money as the courts got involved. The men of the families were able to quit their jobs. Um, you know, moms continue momming, but each family had purchased larger homes and seemingly went on to live normal lives without the stressor of poverty um, with their considerable amount of children, which I'm sure still brought yeah. plenty of stress. I mean, I will say I feel like $2 million might be like about the perfect amount of money to win because it's enough that like it alleviates, you know, all the like bills in the moment you can get rid of all your debt you can set up a college fund buy a house but it's not so much that like you go off the deep end you know yeah it's a, it's a quote-unquote reasonable amount but it's still a lot you're not gonna quit your day well you could quit your day job you but could. you're not gonna live an extravagant no life i could retire right now on 2.6 million for sure yeah, I guess if you invested it well. For sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you get the right financial advisor, it'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's the story wow. of the great Stork Derby. The last slide I have, you can see pictures of the some of the families that won. Um, on the left, we see John and Kathleen Nagel. They're holding up the newspaper. They look happy. That's That face That's... on that man is the face of a man who's been laid a lot <laughs> in the last nine years. <laughs> they are the happiest people I've seen in this uh, photo deck. For sure. The people on the right, they're like, what have we done? <laughs> they look like they've seen some shit. They look like they just crawled out of a basement they've been being held in oh, against no. their will for 20 oh, years. No. They um, look a little shell-shocked. Definitely shell-shocked. They're like, is this real? What is reality? Oh, well, that kid looks happy. There's one kid in the back that's smiling. <laughs> he's the psychopath. He's, he's He still has his mask on. He has the biggest <laughs> smile. <laughs> wow. Well, that's my lesson. Well, I'm glad that they got paid. Me too. I was Goodness worried if the money would somehow get swindled away. Me too. As I was reading this, I'm like, okay, but they don't tell us right off the bat in these sources, like how much money they got. It could have been half a cent like those ministers. <laughs> that would have been so Yeah, what if there up. was no money in the bank? What if it was like a dollar that uh, got invested? I would have sued a damn ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <sighs> All right. Well, we will take a break and be right back. What if, since we have been using Duolingo for our next cocktail hour that is on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, we do Spanish only? Uh, You can take the reins on that because I know how to say puede traer mucho vino. 
Yes, I love that. And that's that. it. <laughs> he can drink a lot of wine. Okay, what about this? What about no, this? No, will you bring me a lot of wine? Oh, I thought Trier was try for some reason. Brave. You're probably right. You're probably right. Will we bring wine? Well, never Maybe. mind. Haley can't run it anymore. I can't run it anymore. <laughs> we okay. have to, I guess, get a real Spanish speaker <laughs> to Revision. help us out. <laughs> Revision. What if for Cinco de Mayo cocktail hour on May 5th at 7 p.m. Central... We did margaritas. Oh, okay. Puede traer muchos margaritas, por favor. Sí, puedo. <laughs> uh, join us on May 5th for our virtual Patreon cocktail hour. We will be drinking margaritas. Do you like a mango, strawberry, or a plain margarita? Strawberry for sure. I'm not a big mm. margarita girl myself. But... That's true. That's true. We can make you something. <laughs> we can make you something else. Uh, we would love to see you there. And if you join Patreon, not only do you get access to our virtual cocktail hours, you get a lot of content. We recently recorded our April list bitch and April night classy trivia. So you can find that there as well. We sure did. And for trivia, if y'all don't know, it's a competition. You can play along. Um, see who won this week. Was it Kat? Was it me? Was it Alec? Alec is now getting points. So you can join at patreon.com slash night classy to get all of that extra sweet, sweet Patreon content. And every single month we have our cocktail hour. We will for see all. you levels. Sorry. How dare you interrupt me. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll see you there. Bye. Are you ready to hear one of the most fucked up things that's happened in American history? Yeah. Yeah, I am. I love this story. And you know what? It's not even true. The way more fucked up things have happened around here than this. True. Uh, we come from a fucked up place. And also, I don't <laughs> love this story for what it entails necessarily. No, but it's fascinating. It's fascinating. The way that just humanity yeah. is insane. <laughs> and it's interesting from start to finish. Like, obviously, the cannibalism is the, like, sensational part. But, like, everything happening, like, leading up and after is equally, yeah. like, I'm not going to say amazing because it was terrible, but fascinating. Jaw-dropping mm -hmm. the entire time. And we've talked about this before, but the way this story makes me feel is the way the show Yellow Jackets makes me feel. Yes, I need to watch Yellow. Give me your Showtime login. I'm trying to figure out how to get it because I logged into Showtime through Apple TV. So it's a whole fucking thing. Okay. Game. Well, when you figure it out, just buy Showtime. Know. That'll be the quickest uh, way for you. <laughs> I pay for so many streaming services. Recently, <laughs> what's that? Um, I know you True do. Bill. I heard a podcast advertising True Bill, which yeah. like, I think it's True Bill, which tells you like what all your monthly bills are. And it told me that I'm subscribed to like eight streaming services. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know. It's like 500 for the horse, 500 for streaming services. Listen, and I wonder why I'm Where struggling. Does my money go. <laughs> yeah. So I canceled a few, but in, uh, I will just try. More. I will try to figure it okay. out. <laughs> okay. Because that's what happens. You like start the free trial to watch one show and then you forget. That's yeah, how they get you. That's their entire it, business that's model. That's the business model. And then right. True Bill's coming in hot. I need to try that too, though, honestly. Yeah. For real. Like Netflix and HBO are the only thing I pay for on purpose. Mm -hmm. There are so many more. I think though. those are the most worth it ones. Definitely. Hulu, maybe, but uh, I I'm know. never on Hulu. Never go to Hulu. I do Peacock $5 a month for The mm -hmm. Office and Parks and Rec. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, uh, in the 1840s, the uh, hot thing to do in the United States was migrate west and steal indigenous land. Typically, Manifest destiny, baby. Exactly. Typically, the way to do this was via the Oregon Trail. You would start in Independence, Missouri, and then you'd travel about 15 miles per day northwest. And actually, I have a map that I sent to Alec. We can just leave the map on the screen the whole time um, because... The entire time I was taking these notes, I was looking at this map. Um, it really helps. It'll be in the YouTube video if you want to look at it. And it'll be linked in the show notes. It's just the um, the the Wikipedia page for what I'm about to talk about. But so you'd go down the Oregon Trail. The Oregon Trail ends up forking um, in, uh, I think that is uh, Wyoming. Yep. And then you can either go uh, to California or... I mean, you would still be going to California, but there's like different ways. And then it like becomes the California trail, whatever. This is the, typically where you, this is typically the trail you go down. And the thing is, 
even if you're planning to go to California, you still continue north a little bit and you go up through Idaho. And then after you go into Idaho, then you head down. So it's not the most direct route, but it is the established route, the most traveled route. Ohio man Lanford Hastings didn't like that you had to take this detour. I feel like Ohio man is second to Florida man. <laughs> yeah, Ohio is the Florida of the North. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. <laughs> oh, well, I guess Kentucky is considered the South. I, yeah. Even though it's not really the South. It's I, still, the South. I still feel like weird shit happens in Ohio. That's why it's a meme. Ohio's very weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he wanted a direct route. And he made one. He proposed a new route that forked off of the Oregon Trail and instead of heading north to Idaho, cut across Utah through the Wasatch Mountain Range and then which is on the western edge of the Rocky Mountains and into Nevada after you crossed the Great Salt Lake Desert. Now, there's a reason people weren't already taking this route besides the fact that it's not actually shorter. It's actually 20 miles longer. Uh, then the other route should just add a day. That's yeah, all. that's if easy. It, they're easy. Doing Fifteen miles a day. They should be able to just crank it up. You know, and just go fast. Uh, add a day. Add a half hour to each each day. You'll be fine. Just add an extra ox into your cart. It's no problem. What's the risk? <laughs> also, the issue <laughs> is that the original trail is an actual trail. There's a worn down path to follow. For your wagon wheels. Well, this other one is just a hypothetical route. There's no trail. Anything's a route if you walk it. If you want it to be <laughs> bad enough. The Wasatch Range would be tough to cross, and so would the Salt Lake Desert. Yeah, it's literally mountains. Uh-huh. And to get into California, to be fair, you did have to cross the Sierra Mountain Range, which is a lot bigger. So it's like, like we do have to cross mountains, but... There's a trail. Yeah, Montana, on the other Montana. One. <laughs> <laughs> Hastings, though, really wanted to make his route, the Hastings Cutoff, happen. He published the Emigrant's Guide to Oregon and California, which suggested the route, even though he had never actually taken it. Oh, my it. God. I love that. A guide, he's like, hypothetically, this would be the guide. He didn't even say hypothetically. I'm pretty sure he so just this said, is do this. <laughs> do this. I've never done it. That's insane. But try it. No offense, but that's insane. Later, he wanted people to do it so bad that he sent riders out to deliver letters to pioneers that were already traveling west to California telling them to use his, quote, new and better road to California. Okay, it's feeling culty. It's feeling I never got attention from my mommy and daddy, so I'm going to make everyone do what I say. Did you talk to his therapist before these notes? I didn't have to. (laughs) In the spring of 1846, one of these letters reached a caravan of about 50 wagons, some of them belonging to our main characters, the Reed and Donner families. The Donners were a pair of wealthy brothers. There was 60-year-old George Donner and 56-year-old Jacob Donner. With them was George Donner's wife, 44-year-old Tamsin, Jacob's wife, 45-year-old Elizabeth, and their, I think, 13 total kids and stepkids, plus a number of Teamsters and servants. There was also 45-year-old James Reed and his 32-year-old wife, Margaret, as well as their four children. Margaret Reed's mother had begun the trip with them, but she died pretty early on just of old age and general sickness. She was pretty weak when they started the trip. Um, If you can't take the mountains, get out of the wagon. Yeah, they didn't even hit any mountains yet. (laughs) If you can't take the planes, they were going, I believe, from Ohio to Missouri. Uh, Girl. Not many mountains yet. Um, But she she was right to die early on, I think. It was (laughs) probably the right call. (laughs) Die while the trip is still easy. (laughs) You know, I can relate. I'm not I'm not ready yet, but as we said at the top of this episode, I don't foresee the climate getting any better. That's so. true. <laughs> People are talking this... about surviving the apocalypse. It will not be me. No, no. I do not <laughs> understand this. I'm not trying to be a hero. I'm trying to be a statistic, okay? Part of the reason, <laughs> though, that this story is so fascinating, it's like many of these people survived under the worst possible circumstance. Like, why would you even want to survive? It just shows you how strong human willpower will to live is. To live. Which 
to be fair, like I've never been in a true life and death situation, so I don't know how I would react, but I think I would choose death Death. over a lot of what's about to happen. Together, the families left Independence, Missouri on May 12th, and the early part of their trip was smooth sailing. They're going around the Oregon Trail until they received Hastings' letter on July 12th. And this is about when they're reaching the fork in the trail. They can either go north toward Idaho or south toward Hastings Cutoff. And you can look on the map. They're about here. So they can, or maybe they're here. No, they're here. So they can either, you know, keep going north up the regular trail or dip down to Fort Bridger where Hastings Cutoff begins. That's the red line. The majority of the caravan decided to go north. They were like, we don't know about this. Let's just do what we know will work. Makes Sense. Makes sense. But Reed was already kind of a big fanboy of Hastings. He had read his book and then they get this letter and they were swayed by the promise of a shorter trip. So they decided to dip down south to Fort Bridger and Hastings cut off. The letter they received also stated that Lansford Hastings himself would be waiting at Black's Fork, which is right by where Hastings Cutoff starts, and he would escort any caravans that showed up across. Because he, by this point, he had done the trail. He had only done it like with by himself on horseback, not with a wagon and a bunch of families. So like he definitely hadn't like fully done it, but at least he's been across before. He's going to show them the way. This gave them enough confidence that they were like, okay, let's just try it. Let's go for it. There were 32 members of the Reed and Donner parties, and ultimately, by the time they reached Hastings Cutoff, a total of 55 others decided to join them on their route, bringing their party to 87. Among the new members were the Graves, Breens, Murphys, Eddies, McCutcheons, Keysburgs, Wolfingers, and a number of Teamsters, single men, and servants. A lot of great name. Wolfingers. Nice. Mm, nice. <laughs> At their height, they wolf also finger. wolf finger. It, I hardly know her. <laughs> <laughs> it is spelled like wolf fingers. Wolf fingers. I can't take hardly it. know her. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At their height, they also had between 60 and 80 wagons, as well as a shit ton of cattle, oxen, horses, mules, and other animals. Like, a lot of these people were farmers, so they brought all their fucking animals. Yeah, of course. Everyone's that was going their livelihood. with me. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then it's like, if things get tough, you could just... Burp. One. <laughs> yeah. But like you also have to keep the animals alive. Like they need water and grass. Like they were really counting on those things. Some of the wagons were also huge. The Reed's wagon was nicknamed the Palace Car. It had a built-in stove, spring cushion seats, and bunk beds. See, that's what I'm talking about. That's yeah. the kind of wagon I'm trying to survive in. They had the RV. Of the caravan. Yeah. And not just your baseline RV. No, the big kind with a garage for your motorcycle. And the one that, like, uh, yeah, it, it, the side goes out mm-hmm. and you have nice, like, hardwood floors or tiling in the yeah. RV. It's like, and it looks primo. like it was made this decade. Yep. Like, it doesn't have that weird 90s interior. Mm-hmm. You can hardly tell it's an RV once you get in there. You think right. it's just a long, skinny house. Yeah, you would live where in Where everything's, there. like, tied down. It's nicer than my apartment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> George Donner, being of relatively high social status, and he was also a pretty, like, cool guy. He was easygoing. He was likable. He was elected to be the group leader. He led the group to Black's Fork, a stop just before Fort Bridger, where Hastings was supposed to meet them. But he was not there. He had already gone off ahead, escorting another caravan. See, that's the issue with not having technology is that you don't know if more people are coming. Right. Yeah, he he had no way of knowing. (laughs) Yeah, he kept his promise. It's not his fault. To the other people, he escorted them. Right. He was there for somebody. At this point, they started kind of doubting their decision. They're like, okay, we don't have a guide anymore. What if we just turned back? Right. It's not too late. No, it wasn't too late. They they could have turned back and then, like, granted, they would have lost some time because they would have had to backtrack and then go across the regular route. Um like, they could have done it. It just would have added some time. Yeah, and I'm sure it was a big decision. I don't mm-hmm. mean to make light of the decision they had in front of them. Um, it's, you know, 
hindsight is twenty twenty. Right. It <laughs> definitely is. And as they're kind of having this debate, they meet a guy named Jim Bridger. And Bridger heard what they were talking about. And he's like, the Hastings cutoff is no problem. Like, you guys, it's super easy. There's tons of water. There's tons of grass for your animals. It'll be a smooth trip. Like, the only hard part is the salt desert. But you'll be fine. You'll be able to get across it easy. And that convinced Reed and the rest of the group that it would be fine. So they oh headed out. Oh, my God. Out. It's like as soon as they walk away, that guy who recommended it to them was like, I can't believe Haley. they believe that. Literally. Oh, no. What no. they didn't know was that Jim Bridger, and it, this is a rumor, but it definitely could be true. He was hiding letters from a journalist that warned the group, at all costs, turn back. Do <gasps> not take this route. Everything Jim had said to convince them was lies. He owned a trading post at the Hastings cutoff. So it would be good for his business if more people took this route. The roller coaster you just sent me. (laughs) Because when you said that, I was like, maybe he was like an activist for indigenous people and didn't want (laughs) he wanted them all to die. No, and unfortunately, then, he was just a selfish bastard. Again, capitalism. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Within days, travel via the Hastings cutoff was much more difficult than anticipated. Drivers had to lock the wheels of their wagons to keep them from rolling down steep hills. And the path was basically non-existent. Like, it was really hard to stay on trail because there was no trail. They navigated by finding letters that Hastings had tied up in trees, instructing them where to go. Because he he had gone up ahead of them. Yeah. On August 6th, they found a letter from him that told them to stop. And he would ride back to show them a different route. Because originally they were supposed to go through a canyon and that's where he led the caravan he was with. But he's like, oh, like this isn't fucking working. And he he's like, don't do it. So he did come back for them to tell oh. them where to go. But they were kind of under the impression he would help them a little more. He pretty much just like pointed, like go that way. Oh, helpful. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then and then he rode back to straight, join the original caravan. Straight shot. <laughs> right. Just keep going straight. It's easy. There was not a trail through the Wasatch Mountain Range, so the group had to make one. This meant sending all able-bodied men in the group ahead to clear brush, cut down trees, move rocks. They had to make enough room for all these uh, giant-ass wagons and herds of cattle. It was extremely slow work. Do you know about what time of year this was? This was July, I believe. Okay. Mm -hmm. so it's like oh no it was august okay so like winter is coming (laughs) winter is yeah it's late summer yeah um like it's around the corner and down the block mm -hmm. but like it's in it's in it's coming yeah but right now it's hot as fuck yeah oh my god are there mosquitoes in like this yeah yeah because they're they're where utah right now so yeah there's okay i mean they're in the mountains so maybe not but still yeah, no. I don't know about in the mountains. There yeah, may not be mosquitoes up not there. Usually Lack a ton. Of moisture, yeah. They were only progressing under a mile and a half a day. Oh no. And it was in the Wasatch Range when the group experienced their first death of a member along Hastings Cutoff. Shit. Luke Halloran died of tuberculosis on August twenty fifth. Did other people get tuberculosis? <laughs> not that I know of. What the hell? I think so far That's it's just him. Maybe like a miracle. other people might later. I'm not sure. Despite all these difficulties, they did make it through the mountains. But on the other side of the mountains, what did they see? Wolves. <laughs> no. <laughs> not that exciting. They saw the Great Salt Lake Desert expanding out before them with the cracked, salty, white surface as far as the eye can see. Hell to the no. You could not pay me to honestly go into a desert, period. You couldn't pay me to do any of this. I think (laughs) we've talked about this on the show so many times, but people from a long time ago, and even people now, but like they were so strong. Like I... 
I would never. I would never. I would complain the entire time. Oh, my God. Our power goes out at 9 p.m. at night. Like, I could have just gone to bed. And I'm like, what the fuck am I supposed to do now? Now I can't (laughs) fall asleep watching Secrets of the Zoo Tampa. (laughs) (laughs) Now I can't charge my phone that's been charging for the last hour and a half and is at 90%. (laughs) What if it dies before the power comes back on? Because you know I'm going to be on TikTok. I need it. What else am I supposed to do? Oh, we're so spoiled. (laughs) I was sitting here thinking how fun it would be to be like tr- clearing the trails and running back and being like, you're never going to believe this cool trail I made for not you. Not if your survival mm. depends on it. Yeah. No, that would make it more fun for you. And I not if you, you have that. Yeah. no food and water <laughs> like and nowhere comfortable to sleep. Like it might be fun for a day. I was thinking about it because <laughs> a lot of the people on the trip, like especially Tamsin, George's wife, she's kind of in a lot of these accounts like romanticized a little bit because she kept really good journals she was really eloquent and she like uh, was excited about this adventure and like wrote about the plants and animals she saw along the way and when you think about it that way it's like okay like it is kind of cool like go like exploring yes but also it would fucking suck yes (laughs) And it reminds me a lot of my lesson last week where we had the Mm -hmm. two adventures. One was just very to the point. Yeah. And the one that got idolized was the one who was very eloquent in his Mm -hmm. writing. And it makes, I think, a huge difference. It was probably a huge form of entertainment for her. I mean, obviously, it was. was. nothing else to do. (laughs) Might as well document it. And who would have thought that it would become such an important documentation of this journey? Totally. Um, so they they see the lake. They well, they don't see the lake. They see the desert, <laughs> the air lake, the, <laughs> the sand, the lake. salt all over the ground, <laughs> and the no water. They also found a tattered letter from Hastings. They pieced together the letter, and it warned them that crossing the desert means about two days and two nights without grass and water. So basically. Get your cattle to eat now, find a spring, stock up, because it's going to be a long wait. In addition to these notes, he also needs to do, like, under-promising and over-delivering. It would be great if the desert only took, like, one day, (laughs) and he told them it'd be two and a half. Spoiler alert, it's the opposite. (laughs) (laughs) He could have done it differently. (laughs) Yeah, it's like when I was a host, I would know it was going to be like a 20-minute wait, but I would tell people 40 minutes so that they're happy. You look like a freaking miracle worker. Yeah, you get to surprise them. Yeah, next honor party, he needs to reassess (laughs) his methods. (laughs) The bad news was after they came out of the mountains, like all their animals were fucking exhausted. They had like they were fucking hungry, thirsty, but there wasn't really time to rest because it had taken them so long to get through the mountains. They had to keep going. So without another choice, they set out on August 30th after just resting for one day. The nights were freezing, but during the day, it was so hot that the moisture from the ground rose to the surface and mixed with the salt, creating like this sticky, muddy, salty goo all over the surface. And, (laughs) And the wagon wheels would sink into it. Sometimes they'd sink all the way up to the hubs. Okay, when I talk about giving up at the slightest inconvenience, <laughs> this is what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I'd be like, okay, it looks like I'm settling in the Wasatch Mountains because this, I can't. This is the equivalence of like going west to when you like walk past something in the loophole and your jeans get stuck on something. I'd oh my like, God, for real. God fucking damn it, <laughs> as I do. Yeah, that, that is the And worst. that would be it. <laughs> The group traveled for three days and without an end in sight, ran out of water. Mm -mm. Some of the animals became so weak, they fell and couldn't go on. That'd be so tragic to watch. Yeah. It'd be horrible. Yeah. That's like the writings on the wall. Mm -hmm. The ones that fell were left yoked to the wagons and abandoned. Oh, Oh my God. Okay. It's getting bad. It's getting Mm -hmm. bad. Some of the oxen were purposely set free to give them a chance. Others, desperate for water, broke out of their harnesses and ran away. Poor babies. This breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. In the end, the 40-mile, three-day journey was actually over 80 miles and took six days. 
Luckily, no human lives were lost in the desert, and on the sixth day, they reached a freshwater spring. They stopped at the spring. They took a few days to make repairs on the wagons. They rounded up as many cattle as they could. Everyone had suffered huge losses. Yeah. Them seeing the fresh water, it's it's giving holes when it rains. <laughs> yeah. And one thing I didn't mention in my notes, but they were all seeing mirages, like yeah. thinking there was water like around, like just up ahead. That's what I was for wondering. For six days. Yeah. Two days And then into finally it. you see it and it's real. <laughs> The Reeds <laughs> lost a lot. They became really, well, especially Mr. Reed, became really paranoid about supplies and started demanding the other families take inventory and report their inventory to him and they can pool supplies. And everyone's like, fuck you, dude. Like, we're good. Like, we're not going to share and fuck off. It's not like my job to tell you what I have. So dissent is kind of being sowed here. Yep, Totally. He also sent two men up ahead to California to bring back supplies because he had no fucking supplies left. So he sent two of his guys to ride up ahead. They could go a lot faster than the caravan, obviously, with just two of them. And then he sent two other men to round up the missing oxen. These guys go out. And when they come back, they have the bad news that there's another 40 miles of desert ahead. (gasps) That just gave me goosebumps. Uh Uh-huh. They were also running so low on oxen because so many of them died or ran away because of their thirst that whatever animals they did have left, they just used to pull the carts. So now the now the wagons are being pulled with just like oxen, cows, mules, like whatever they had left that they could strap to a wagon. I just had this vision of them like riding like so tired through the desert trying to (laughs) entertain themselves and being like shabuya sha, sha, shabuya roll call my name is tasman yeah <laughs> i see a leaf yeah <laughs> oh no That's- i like that you call her tasman like like What's- tamsin and jasmine <laughs> mixed together i thought her name was tasman. tasman's a cool name i like the name taz what is what is her name actually tamsin tamsin yeah you said tamsin i thought tamlin like in a court of oh, thorns and roses yeah, yeah, which yeah. turns into tasman Tas- <laughs> Tas- tasmanian double, tasmanian double. <laughs> miraculously though they made it through the next stretch of desert and were able to pick back up and follow hastings tracks They made it all the way to the Humboldt River, which meant they were back on the original trail. So if we look back on this map, they are now back in the green. Man, I am like, I know this story all right. Obviously Mm -hmm. not the details like Mm -hmm. this, but I really thought that things got real bad during the Hastings cutoff or Hastings cutoff. I I mean, (laughs) the bad part about the Hastings cutoff is that that set them back. So that was a quote unquote shortcut that really sucked like luckily like there there was one fatality he was gonna die anyway like they're pretty much okay on the Hastings cutoff but it delayed them by a month because they had to cut their way through the mountains that's a lot because they had already left at the very tail end of the pioneering season they were some of the last pioneers to leave the midwest and winter was coming Along the main trail, the group was met by Paiute Native Americans who stole and shot a number of their horses and oxen. Boo fucking who. But like (laughs) it definitely made things worse for these guys. To make better time, the Donner family went off ahead. They're like, fuck y'all. We're just going to keep going. (laughs) And they left the rest of the group to follow like about a day behind them. It was now October. It's getting cold. This group is now left behind with their leader because their leader was... George Donner and second in command uh, was Reed. But like now they don't really like Reed because he's paranoid and aggressive. And so tensions are rising. Two wagons got tangled up. And out, like I think like the cattle just got like mixed up and like now the wagons are kind of like stuck together. Uh, yeah, like they do. Like, like it like happens, you know, all those times that you've gone on a wagon yeah. train and From my past the wagons lives, get tangled. I cannot tell you how many fucking <laughs> times we've had to untangle wagons. <laughs> Who do you think out of the three of us would start to get neurotic first if we were in this party? That's a tough one. I think you. 
I think I would get stressed with the 80 people behind me slowing it down. I would want to be like on a horseback going ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would just be complaining. Yeah. you. you I don't think I'd be that stressed, (laughs) but I'd be really angry. You'd be angry. You would have laid down in the desert. That's true. Like, this I would never have good. gone in the first place. I'd be like, we are wealthy and have a big farm. Why yeah, are we doing why? this? Yeah. Literally, why? <laughs> Someone give me one good reason. Think of all the cryptids you could, you could encounter. That's true. I wonder yeah. if anyone wrote about cryptids in any of these journals. Probably not. Are we? I'm sure they would be part of the story. Especially when you start hallucinating. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> So the the wagons are tangled. Uh, John Snyder is frustrated and he starts beating one of Reed's oxen to like make it move and untangle the wagons. This pisses Reed off, who then gets in his face and tells him to stop. Yeah, I'd be pissed too. Me too, of course. But then Snyder attacks him. He starts hitting Reed with the whip handle. So now they're fighting. Oh, God. Reed's wife, Margaret, runs over and tries to break them up. And uh, she gets in the mix. And Snyder, whether accidentally or on purpose, ends up hitting Margaret, according to some accounts. That's when Reed was like, hell no. He pulls out a knife. Oop. And shouldn't have brought a knife to a to a whip party. (laughs) (laughs) He stabs Snyder in the collarbone. And kills him. Uh, yeah, that'll do it. Mm-hmm. That'll do, mm-hmm. Donkey. <laughs> that'll do. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so Reed has committed murder, but there are no laws or law enforcement west of the Continental Divide. Yeah, is it murder if it's west of the Continental Divide? I don't know. If it's a murder say. happens west of the Continental Divide, <laughs> and no one's there to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's now up to the caravan to decide what to do with him. But remember, George Donner is gone. They don't have a leader. So they're all now fighting again. Snyder had clearly instigated the fight. Most of people around had seen this, but people liked Snyder. They did not like Reed. That charisma gets you a long way. <laughs> it does. even S- Especially as a murderer. <laughs> yeah. Kiesberg, which we'll find out later, he's kind of often made out as the villain uh, in a lot of these accounts. He suggests hanging him. It's like, let's just hang him. Just leave him out to dry. Well, that's kind of what they do. They end up exiling him without his family. Um, they're, he's not allowed to have any provisions. He's not allowed to be armed. They just the next morning, they're like, okay, go. Luckily for him, though, his daughter Virginia snuck him food and a rifle, and he ended up catching up with the Donners, who, remember, are his friends. Yeah. And he and one of the Donners teamst- teamsters, Walter Heron, take a horse and head off together ahead of everyone else. They just dip out. That would be Alec going with this guy. Yeah, he's like, all right, I'll see you later. Maybe. Yeah, maybe I've if I do. Had enough of this. I'll see Bullshit. you when I see you. Yeah. <laughs> the rest of the group too caught up with the Donners. So now they're all combined again. They keep going, but the animals at this point are so weak that everyone has to walk because they don't want any extra weight in the carriages. Even Hardcoop, who is an elderly man, he didn't have a family. He just kind of like hitched a ride with Keesberg. And he had been riding in Keesberg's uh, what am I? Wagon. wagon. God. And But now everyone's expected to walk. And Keesberg is like kind of a dick. And he kicks Hardcoop out. He's like, everyone has to walk, even you, old man. Uh, Hardcoop, Hardcoop can't really walk, though. He's... Oh. He's almost 70, which I guess he was a rough 70. Uh, So he can't go very far before he just sits down by a stream. And reportedly his feet were so swollen, they had split open. (gasps) Oh, no. I take it back. It's not fair. Don't make him walk. I know. But the group left him there to die. They should have at least, like, brought the body. Well, why? Oh, <laughs> yeah. You know They weren't why. there yet. <laughs> but yeah, and I guess there was one guy who didn't have a wagon, but was like going around to wagons, like telling them about this guy, like begging someone to take him in and nobody That's would. That's awful. That's awful. Yeah. I mean, For that joke awful. that I just made, like, please. Yeah. It was it was just a joke. Definitely. This is all awful. I'm just trying it's to. It's awful, but also most of these people have like children and employees they have to feed. They don't have enough supplies. Like, I don't know. Like, you're just doing what you have to do. Yeah, it's, for, it's so complex. There's, like, of course, like, you should help. But 
it was it was a tough a tough go. Yeah. I don't think I could leave somebody unless yeah. they did what they did in Haley's lesson last week, which mm-hmm. is they on self-sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think I could either. But I mean, none of us know what we would do That's true. in this situation. I mean, Kiesberg is the original asshole for kicking him out of <laughs> his wagon. Yeah, for sure. And then it's also like, okay, no, I don't. You have to plan, I think, for the very absolute worst mm-hmm. if you're going to go west. Yeah, yeah. If this guy, I don't know, he was alone. Yeah, I don't think he had fam. I, he was, you know what, Haley? He was a free spirit. For sure. I just hate that he had to die this way. Me too. It's awful. It's it's absolutely terrible. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's much not like going to get any better. Every other detail <laughs> in this story. Thank you. <laughs> Meanwhile, people's cows and oxen and horses are still being stolen left and right uh, by Paiutes. Some families were forced to leave behind their wagon now that they didn't have anything to pull it with. Everyone was going hungry and thirsty. Supplies were running really low. But then they reached the lush, wet, trucky river along the Sierra Nevada foothills. The real river. <laughs> the real river. So now they're finally like, there's water, there's resources, but there's only those things because like they're about to have to cross the fucking mountains. They are right up at the edge. Oh, I would just stop. I would say this is good enough. We're pretty fucking close yeah they're really close so here on the map you can see the the truckee rivers uh highlighted it's right by lake tahoe Uh, they just have to cross the sierra nevadas yeah it's gotta be fucking beautiful Mm -hmm. the sierra nevadas are much larger much more difficult to pass than the wasatch mountains by this time it's october 20th By mid-November, the mountains will be fully snowed over and impassable. So they have about a month before they're dead. Everyone was debating whether it would be best to wait for a few days, you know, let everyone recover, get some water, let the oxen graze, or if they needed to just like fucking go because they're running out of time. Oh, I'm team rest. Team rest. But then what if you get snowed in? just stay near the lake build a little cabin but but they're either at the lake yeah exactly so you want you want to rest all winter stay through winter they're they're debating if they should rest like three days or keep going yeah i would i would rest three days for sure (laughs) (laughs) i'm i'm a nap girl you know i know you're yeah you're definitely the rest i i'm the keep going and get it over with (laughs) yeah miss i tried to drive 17 fucking hours i did drive (laughs) well alec drove the last little bit but the last eight we (laughs) did a little bit (laughs) while she slept the last half Okay, we did it all in one day. We got from Miami to Memphis in one day. I'm proud of us. Miami to Memphis. <laughs> they're they're bickering about this, deciding, and uh, William Foster's gun discharges. It's an oh. accident. He was loading it irresponsibly, and it popped off. You know what? Yes. For the mid-1800s, I believe that. <laughs> uh, for today, I believe that. This shit happens all the time. It ended up striking William Pike, instantly killing him. Oh, you believe it was an accident? I believe I it was an accident. I see what you're saying now. Yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so now another person is dead. And now there's chaos. And so now they're, like, they're just like, fuck it. Like, let's just, let's just go. Like, after this happens, that's kind of the last straw. Yeah, they're like, ugh. Spooky. Ugh, blood. <laughs> blood. Let's keep Pop it moving. <laughs> Hitch the wagon. <laughs> So they they push on into the mountains. Not long into the trip, they find that their bad luck was not over. An early October snow began to fall. Of course it did. Of course. They sh- yeah, they should have known at this point. Uh, yeah. Just, just kidding. They could have known. foreshadowing means anything. <sighs> one it's- by one, the families pushed up a 1,000 foot tall, quote, massive, nearly vertical slope. To Truckee Lake. (gasps) Stair Mountain. (laughs) Three miles from the summit, they were stopped in their tracks. The trail had been buried by snowdrifts as high as 10 feet tall. Oh, they're fucked. It was October, and they're now trapped on the mountain for the winter. That's what I'm... Team rest. If you have the option to rest or to go on, 
rest. Yeah. At least be near the fucking water. Yeah. <sighs> so about how many people are now stuck here? 87. No, I think they started with 87, so 85 now that two have died. Okay, and the Donners oh, and are then, not there? No, the Donners are there. Two people, so I guess Reed and that Teamster went off ahead, so 83. Didn't Reed go off with the Donners? No, the Donners are still back. Reed went off with one of the Donners Teamsters. Okay. So they're gone, but the Donners and all the other families are still here. I thought the Donners went up ahead. They were only ahead by like a day. Oh, and by okay. now they're back all together. Okay. They were just kind of blazing the trail for everyone else. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So the murderer guy, the knife guy is not there. No, he's gone. He's he's probably already over the mountain by now. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Did he survive? Do we know? Maybe. Okay. You will find out next week. That was oh, part one. God damn it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I really wanted to do it all in one, but... This is already six pages, which is already like a long lesson for me. So I yeah. couldn't have done it. I think it deserves two parts. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love this lesson. Oh, it's a it's an incredible story. And I was excited to cover it. So that is part one of the Donner Party. Make sure you tune in next week to hear what happens on the mountain. All dun, 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 right. dun, dun, dun. Well, I'll surely be back. I hope you all will come back too. And we're going to go ahead and record our extra credit this week, our Patreon show that comes out every single week. We continue the conversation over on Patreon at patreon.com slash night classy. We will see you there. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for supporting the pod. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. And we love you so much. We'll see you next week. Three, two, one. Class, Class dismissed. dismissed.